Welcome back to my tutorial series, Creoles are not a distinct kind of language, true or false, or do linguists have any reason to be interested in these languages as opposed to anthropologists or historians? Today we want to do questions and answers from lesson two, where the question was, has the idea of a Creole prototype been refuted? Now, as I said before, anyone who says that the prototype idea has been refuted by counterexamples, which is often said, should be asked one simple question, what are they? As I've shown, the answer is not Magua French or Mandarin Chinese or Soninke or Old Chinese. These are the proposals that have been made. I have refuted them in print several times. Now, Something that you might hear is, well, for one thing, you should go to the work of Michel de Graff, who, no, no. Michel de Graff has written all sorts of things. His writings are certainly voluminous, but in none of them has he presented a counterexample to the Creole prototype, as in finding a language with what is, by all indications, an ordinary, unbroken history of transmission that has those three traits that I mentioned. Michel de Graff has shown that one Creole Haitian isn't perfectly prototypical, but my hypothesis accounts for that, and I showed in my last lecture that it accounts for that in a fashion that no scientifically minded person could possibly consider circular. Now, as to some of the feedback from lesson two, David Gill has suggested that just perhaps we could say that Riau Indonesian isn't a Creole and therefore isn't a counterexample because of having some opaque derivation. But then on the other hand, I'm also inclined to say that there are languages that we could call Creoles with all acknowledgement that these things are clinal, where they have some opaque derivation that they have basically inherited from being in contact constantly with their source languages. In any case, what David has mentioned is, for example, this on suffix in Riau Indonesian, as in Indonesian in general, and we see a certain amount of opacity here. I mean, even against my own point, it seems that if you have cook and then cuisine and then play and then toy, that makes a certain sense. What does seem to be unpredictable is that you have sell and then sell habitually. If this on is the same morpheme, then obviously that's different from one that turns play into toy. And if you look at, for example, the standard grammar of Indonesian for linguists, Sneden, you see that this on morpheme is extremely multifarious and rather unpredictable. And so it could be that Riau Indonesian has taken in some of this. David and everybody, I would say that we need to look at the issue of degree. And so, for example, there are various other derivational morphemes in Indonesian, and I would like to know whether they, such as, you know, bear, are incorporated in Rio Indonesian and whether they're incorporated in opaque ways or not. David also brings up a very interesting paper to appear by Aon von Engelenhoven, which is about the Ewau language of K Island in Indonesia, where apparently almost all of the derivational affixes have become non-productive. And that's interesting because there's no reason to think that Ewau has been a lingua franca to any significant degree that would have anything to do with shaving down its structural elaboration. But what you see in Ewau from the paper is that the derivation is non-productive, but it's not opaque it still serves the purposes that it always served in terms of creating new words. And we have to be careful because non-productive morphemes can still be transparent and not opaque. We can't equate non-productivity and opacity. So for example, in English, itty is not productive, but it's transparent. Or th, as in you know, warmth, girth, etc., is from what I can think of spontaneously, it's always transparent even though you can't create new words with the. So, I reiterate, anyone who says that the prototype idea has been refuted by counterexamples has to be asked one simple question, what are they? And this is where this sort of issue tends to go 
and that certainly includes this one. You ask what are they and after a while the response becomes rather than the presentation of a counterexample you know I don't really care I don't care about this all of this willy-nilly all this argument isn't it just time to move on I don't care if there's a prototype enough of this that's an interesting response and yes it does really happen sometimes even in print and so Paul Robert, very much in passing, reviewing a book a long time ago, said, I will not be losing any sleep over the coherence of the field if Creoles are not a linguistically definable class. So let's, let's just get past this. Well, I don't know. I find that if we can identify what a Creole is, then it could have larger implications. It's not just about whether or not there's a Creole. That all by itself, I do find it interesting, but there's more. So, for example, let's go to the island of Flores in Indonesia. There's a language in Flores called Keo, and you can look at it here, and what's interesting is that Keo has no affixation at all. It's very interesting. Not inflectional, not derivational. It's this affixless language. You can see it right here. Languages of central Flores in particular are like this. Here's another one, Ronga, which is probably the best documented at this point. And this is what the whole language looks like. There are no affixes. It's just not there. And these languages do have batteries of numeral classifiers, but from what I can see from the descriptions, the classifiers are pretty tidy. They're not like Chinese. They seem to be ones where you don't have arbitrary distinctions that are the kind that you would call paradigmatic inflection. Rather, something seems to be going on, and none of the descriptions really care that much about derivation, but from what you see in them, it doesn't look like they are spilling over with the kind of opaque derivation that you see in, for example, Old Chinese, as I showed in Lesson 2 itself. Now, we have to understand, this is not what Austronesian languages are like in this area. This is from nearby Sulawesi, southeastern Sulawesi. This is Tukang Besi from Mark Donahue's Wonderful Grammar. And as you can see, it's highly affixal. It's a, it's a language that would not occasion any sense of anything ever having happened to it. And this is true of the surrounding languages. Suddenly, just in Central Flores, you have this strangely telegraphic kind of language. There are six or seven of them. Now, you can look at languages like that and think that they just got that way by accident. Well, talk about losing sleep, that could put you to sleep. Or you might propose a hypothesis, and I have proposed that the languages of Central Flores are not languages that have had ordinary transmission. It seems to me that the case that there is a Creole prototype is such that, as I've said, we might even try to turn the tables and use languages that look something like that as indications of a past that otherwise is not recoverable or for which we're only going to find hints. I'll get to that in a second. But the hypothesis would be that these languages were at some point in their history acquired mostly by adults. And what suggests that is that they seem so close to the Creole prototype if they're not at it and that this is highly unusual in the Austronesian language family, other than ones like Riau Indonesian, where we've seen what the case would be for unusual broken transmission. So, there are so many indications beyond just this affixlessness that indicate that something's going on with these languages. So, for example, a quick review of the difference between contextual inflection and inherent inflection. Contextual inflection, quote-unquote, does something. So that's case, agreement, grammatical gender, and things like that. Inherent inflection, quote-unquote, means something. It's more transparent in our minds. That's tense, that's mood, that's number, that's the kind of thing that you would be spontaneously given to adding to a language you were making up, as opposed to the contextual inflection, which you would probably only get to later, especially if you're a Western European language speaker. So, indication one in these Flores languages is adult acquisition threatens contextual inflection much more than inherent inflection. So ordinarily, both of them are broken and come back, and broken and come back, they survive. 
but it's been shown conclusively that it is typical of Creoles that the contextual inflection is gone or all but gone. Inherent inflection, whether it's bound or not, is preserved. These Central Flores languages have unbound inherent inflection, but not contextual inflection. Indication two. When affixes erode, they leave footprints. And that's something that you see all over Indonesia in languages that are relatively low on segmental affixes. So in English, you have the sorts of processes that make a plural like feet, well known from linguistics textbooks. In French, well, okay, Latin's inflection in the noun phrase has worn away to a considerable extent, but left a different version of itself in terms of, for example, the liaison rules. Then, of course, in many parts of the world, you see how an affix will erode, but it'll leave a tonal distinction, such as in the Sino-Tibetan language, Lahu. Indication three, pigeons, if we're imagining that these languages were reduced to something much less elaborate than they were, and maybe even something you would call a pigeon, pigeons tend towards having two-syllable words. Now, if you look at the Swadesh list and you look at a great many languages in this area, you can see that these languages of specifically Central Flores, not Western, not Eastern, but Central, are more bisyllabic than any other languages in the whole region. So Austronesian is not known for its really long words, but in the Swadesh list, there are 20 words over two syllables in this Tukang Besi language, 17 in a language close to it, but then in two of these Central Flores languages, just one, just two, and it tends to be compounds. So all of these things together. And then genetic analysis. This is preliminary. I'm working on this issue with the people at the Santa Fe Institute right now. But it's interesting in a preliminary way that there's evidence of some sort of genetic bottleneck among males on the island of Flores. So are you falling asleep yet? This is the sort of thing where if you're armed with the idea that there is a such thing as a Creole and that it involves the conglomeration of those three absences in a language that have nothing to do with whether or not it's a real language or a nuanced instrument for human communication, then you might be able to say some things about linguistic and human history. We shall see. So, if you look at something like Central Flores, the Creole exceptionalism approach is, hmm, these languages are almost Creoles, and you imagine there might be a reason. Let's investigate what it may have been. Fun, interesting, who knows where it might go? Maybe nowhere, maybe somewhere, but the idea is to indulge curiosity. Now, the uniformitarian approach to Central Flores, if that sort of thing happened to come to their attention, would really be this, and I mean none of this is caricature. For Mufwene, language contact is just mixture of features. So he would say that there must have been some highly analytic language in what he calls the feature pool. But the problem is that there wasn't, unless you're talking about the fact that colloquial Indonesian is the language of larger communication in this area, and so almost anywhere you go, that is a language that frankly is often threatening the local languages. But the thing is, colloquial Indonesian hasn't made the vast number of languages in Indonesia like these particular few ones in Central Flores. Something specific is going on. So feature pool simply wouldn't work. Michel de Graff and Enoch Abo would tell us that all language change is about quote-unquote cascades, that's the language from Abo and de Graff 2017 that's getting around lately, cascades of L1 and L2 acquisition. And so all language change is the same, and if we say otherwise, then we're saying that the Floresians were cognitively abnormal in some way. I'm not sure where that takes us as scientists. Then Umberto Ansaldo would say that a language is analytic when all of the languages that came into contact were analytic, but in this case they simply weren't, and so we move on. So, I don't really care. Creole prototype enough, let's move on. I don't care. Really? I mean, wouldn't many of the people who said that care if, for example, a counterexample were found? And if I may, I suspect that they would care not 
just because they might understandably enjoy seeing me get my comeuppance. They would care because suddenly it would seem interesting. And we might ask, why would someone not care about a definition foundational to a field of inquiry? Can you imagine that happening among biologists, for example? I don't care what the definition of a reptile is. I know it when I see it and I'm studying my little lizard. No, that's not how it usually goes. So let's get down to what's really going on here, why people might not care or why people consider this whole debate closed without seeing the need to actually specify what evidence they consider it to have been closed by. It's because everybody is scared. I hate to put it that way, but there is an obvious element here, and it's things like this. A late example here is Abo and de Graaff, 2017. This is almost certainly written by de Graaff. De Graaff is well known for opening his papers with long, angry recountings of repulsive things that were said about Creoles and their speakers in the past, and sometimes the present. I have here a screenshot from Abo and de Graaff. You should read it. This is very typical. So, in the minds of many people is we have to think about the fact that Creoles have been the subject of this kind of dismissal, and therefore we have to be careful in saying that there's a Creole prototype that involves three things that the languages don't have. Now, that caution is perfectly understandable, I'm well aware of it, and I spell out in my papers all the time that I'm not talking about anything that has to do with sophistication. I'm talking about detritus in languages, which you could consider Creoles as fleet in being without. But it comes down to this. The existence and power of racism in the world does not itself render the theories of Sali Coco Mufwene and Michelle de Graff correct. It's one thing to acknowledge the power of racism in the past and the present. But to allow the discussion of issues like these to just sit there is, frankly, unscientific. I'm going to push it even further, because this reflects what the reality of this is. The existence and power of racism in the world does not justify engaging the theories of Sali Coco Mufwene and Michel de Graff critically only in private settings, but never in public or in print. So, well, I don't care. Really? I suspect many linguists would indeed care whether we could identify a structural signature of creolization. And linguists need not fear that this basic empirical curiosity renders them morally repugnant. Once again, when you're taught that the prototype proposal has been soundly refuted, you are not getting the information you need to decide whether Creoles are a kind of language. Standing unanswered against anything you read or hear, breezily or indignantly treating the concept of Creole as outdated, is the question, which languages refute the Creole prototype idea? I don't care does not cohere as an answer here, because the prototype proposal directly contradicts the basic structure of their reasoning and claims. And just in case, is the prototype idea and Creole exceptionalism in general invalid in not having been expressed in terms of phases, parameters, and spec of CP? See Lesson 3.